World War I and the Treaty of Versailles solved nothing and satisfied no one. Although the Western democracies, such as France and Britain, regained some stability and prosperity, no one else did. Ethnic and territorial disputes arose among the new democracies in Eastern Europe. The Bolsheviks in Russia threatened to spread their revolution and overthrow capitalism. Italy and Germany, the one a winner and the other a loser in the war, were both bitter about the Treaty of Versailles and anxious to reverse its verdict. These conditions gave rise to fascism, the belief in a totalitarian dictatorship controlling nearly all aspects of the state, government, army, press, schools, and others. However, unlike the Soviet model of communism, it allowed free enterprise and private property. It appealed to the business-oriented middle class since it gave them economic security. Finally, fascism was also intensely nationalistic and aggressive in its foreign policy. The first successful fascist takeover was in Italy under Benito Mussolini. As a young adult, he fled to Switzerland to avoid the draft and was converted to socialism there. In 1904, he returned to Italy and served time in the army in return for a pardon. He then became the editor of La Lotta di Classe, or The Class Struggle. He advocated both political assassination and pacifist resistance to a war with Turkey. He called the national flag a rag fit to be planted on a dung heap. When World War I broke out, Mussolini became editor of the national daily Avanti, or Forward. In the paper, he first advocated neutrality and then, probably after accepting French bribes, called for Italian involvement on the Allied side. Italy made a poor showing in the war and paid a heavy price for it in men and cash. Government expenditure during the war was twice its expenditure for the whole period from 1861 to 1913. As a result, the economy was in shambles and the country was plagued with unemployment, inflation, riots, strikes, and violence. It was then that Mussolini first joined, and soon became leader, of the Fascist Party, which stood for upholding claims of veterans and the nationalist interests of Italy while crushing any anarchist elements in the country. Ironically, the fascists did more to promote anarchy than anyone else in Italy at that time. Mussolini would send out his gangs of thugs, the black shirts, to riot against communists and other groups while claiming his men were protecting the peace. Oddly enough, Mussolini's strategy of spreading chaos in the streets while posing as the champion of law and order who could save Italy started paying off. Even without the black shirts' antics, Italy needed law and order, and many people, especially the middle class who feared the communists, looked to the fascists as the answer to Italy's problems. In October 1922, they made their move. be on Empire Day, and as if to celebrate the happy union of two great events, a day to dream about, a day to make California, Florida, and all the other sunspots green with envy. The boiling sun shines down on as mighty a crowd as ever, and all the fun of the fair. Maybe their majesties, the king and queen, are listening on their far journey, but the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester and the Duke and Duchess of Kent are here as usual, for the three minutes of flashing hooves that is a magnet to prince and beggar alike. And now the hush falls across Epsom, and they're away! Into the lead at the start goes Fair Chance and Casanova, with the rest in a bunch up the hill. And now Pathy Gazette presents a magnificent follow shot from the high tower, a far better view than anyone on the course. In the lead at this stage is Heliopolis, with large field close behind. So watch those leaders, a picture that conveys all the tremendous thrill of the greatest horse race in the world. As they swing round the big bend to Tattenham Corner, are you still watching those leaders? Because if you are, you'll see Larchfield take the lead from Heliopolis. There they go. Round Tattenham Corner, Larchfield is in front, and now comes the tremendous thrill as Blue Peter steals the race. Blue Peter is on this side, nearest the camera, and Blue Peter goes to the front. And after that, it's all Blue Peter. 
And do I have to tell you that he's going like sizzling lightning? So it's Blue Peter, Fox Cub and Heliopolis. The gypsies say that when the flowers bloom on the gypsy boy's grave at the crossroads, a new market horse wins the derby. And it's true. In 1921, the fascists' fortunes in Italy took a dramatic upturn. Industrialists and landowners openly backed the fascists. In the May election, 35 fascists, Mussolini among them, won seats in major power, thus reviving the Roman Empire. Here again, little progress was made, although Benito made wildly inflated claims about Italy's military strength. Whatever his failures as a national leader, Mussolini appeared to be a shining example of fascist strength when compared to the more timid democracies in Europe and was a hero to other aspiring fascist leaders of the day. Among these was a struggling German politician by the name of Adolf Hitler. After Mussolini had seized power and while Hitler was still seeking it, the Italian embassy in Berlin received a letter from Hitler respectfully asking for an autographed picture of the Duce. The request elicited a snub from Rome. Meeting Hitler for the first time in 1934, after Hitler was named Chancellor, Mussolini privately pronounced him a mad little clown, a verdict later upgraded to dangerous fool. In less than a decade, Mussolini would be publicly fawning over Hitler and moving in his shadow. Down the bright straight road towards a new understanding in Europe. And so at Hitler's Munich headquarters, the agreement that has made the biggest headline since the armistice. Let no man criticize the bargain that the statesmen of Britain and France have struck until he has attempted to add up the total price that might have had to be paid for any other settlement. A price in death and destruction. That price will not be paid. There will be peace. It's the greatest diplomatic triumph of modern time. And the Prime Minister comes home. Home to an empire filled with joy and relief home to a welcome that he will never forget. This morning, I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. We regard the agreement signed last night and the Anglo-German naval agreement as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again. again. And thus to contribute to assure the peace of Europe. From Heston, a triumphal progress as Mr. Chamberlain drives to report immediately to His Majesty the King at Buckingham Palace. And in this, perhaps the most historic spot of the Empire's capital, let the people themselves speak what is in their hearts. Within a few hours, the Nazi machine sweeps into Czechoslovakia. watches the rise of Europe's new frontiers of concrete and steel, Germany's Siegfried Line. And Germany looks across the Rhine towards the Maginot Line of France. 1938 will be remembered as the year in which the French government first permitted the newsreels to take pictures inside the greatest line of fortification the world has ever seen. France is prepared. As the eruptions of the old year pass, we welcome the new dawn of preparedness for peace. We join hands in the new spirit of joy and friendship.
At 39, Mussolini was the youngest premier in Italy's history. A lion head, piercing black eyes, and a jutting jaw made up for a height of only five feet six inches. Fitness was a fetish with him, and that was reflected in his powerful frame. As prime minister, the first years of Mussolini's reign were characterized by a coalition government composed of nationalists, liberals, and populists. He did not assume dictatorial connotations. In domestic politics, Mussolini favored the complete restoration of state authority. He supported the wealthy industrial and agrarian classes through the introduction of legislation that provided for privatization, the liberalization of rent laws, and the banning of unions. The assassination of the socialist deputy, Giacomo Matteotti, who had requested the annulment of the elections because of the irregularities committed, provoked a momentary crisis for the Mussolini government. The weak response of the opposition was not sufficient to distance the ruling classes and the monarchy from Mussolini, who on 3 January 1925 broke open the floodgates. In a famous discourse, he took upon himself all of the responsibility for the assassination of Matteotti. He then proclaimed a de facto dictatorship, suppressing every residual liberty and completing the identification of the fascist party with the state. Under the banners of nationalism and state power, fascism seemed to synthesize the glorious Roman past with a futuristic utopia. In the 1930s, Italy recovered from the Great Depression and achieved economic growth, in part by developing domestic substitutes for imports. But growth was undermined by international sanctions following Italy's October 1935 invasion of Ethiopia and by the government's costly military support for Franco's nationalists in Spain. Benito Mussolini, the fascist dictator of Italy, had long held a desire for an Italian empire, reminiscent of the Roman Empire, to rule over the Mediterranean and to also avenge Italian losses at the Battle of Adwa, which took place in Ethiopia on March 1, 1896. Mussolini promised the Italian people a place in the sun, similar to the United Kingdom and France, who both had large empires at the time. Ethiopia was a prime candidate for this expansionist goal for several reasons. It was one of the few African nations that was not a European colony, and it would serve to unify the Italian-held Eritrea to the northwest and Italian Somaliland to the east. It was considered to be militarily weak and rich in resources, easy pickings for the new Caesar. Alertness, strength, courage. The heroic RAF takes to the air. Another German plane meets its master. Convoy merchantmen brave constant danger from the sky. Each ship becomes a target for the raider's bomb. Each ship is set on getting supplies safely to Englishmen, to Welshmen, to Scots, to all ashore. Under brave General de Gaulle, three Frenchmen still fight Germany. London. Waves of Nazi planes swarm westward to the world's largest city. Some reach London's warehouses, tenements, and great docks. Londoners take to shelter unafraid. Old and young, their spirits undismayed. their heads destruction is falling from the blacked out heaven. Artillery and bomb pandemonium rages for hours, days, and months. London burns by night. The daylight 
Wright finds undaunted grit and confidence as the job of digging out proceeds. Even the dummies get attention. We mean dummy. Buckingham Palace, still of empire, residence of Britain's monarchs, does not escape the Nazi reign of steel. King George and Queen Elizabeth examine a piece of the missile that demolished the park of their palace home. St. Paul's Cathedral, where royalty and commoner worship, also suffered. A bomb pierces the roof, destroys an altar, but spares other treasured monuments. The heroic RAF takes an ever-increasing toll. Nazi planes have fallen on English soil by the thousands. May well be that the final extinction of a baleful domination will pave the way to a broader solidarity of all the men in all the land than we could ever have planned if we had not marched together through the fire. The Italo-Ethiopian Treaty of 1928 that delimited the border between Italian Somaliland and Ethiopia stated the border was 21 leagues parallel to the Benadir coast. The Italians interpreted this to mean 21 nautical leagues as opposed to 21 standard leagues, which then gave them greater territory. Acting on this, they built a fort at the Walwal Oasis in the Ogaden Desert in 1930, disregarding the treaty. By 1932, the advance from Italian Somaliland was noticeable, as roads were being built well within what was considered Ethiopian territory. In November of 1934, Ethiopian territorial troops, accompanied by the Anglo-Ethiopian Boundary Commission, moved to halt Italy's incursion. In early December, the tensions mounted to a clash that left 150 Ethiopian and 50 Italian casualties. This resulted in the Abyssinia Crisis at the League of Nations. The League of Nations exonerated both parties for the Walwal, but Italy ignored the diplomatic route and soon began to build its forces on the borders of Ethiopia in Eritrea and Italian Somaliland. With an attack appearing to be inevitable, the Emperor Haile Selassie ordered a general mobilization. His new recruits consisted of around 500,000 men, many of whom were armed with primitive weapons, such as spears and bows. Those equipped with rifles were using outdated weapons from the late 19th century, yet they fought well. On 3 October 1935, without declaration of war, Marshal Emilio de Bono advanced into Ethiopia from Eritrea. De Bono had a force of 100,000 Italian soldiers and 25,000 Eritrean soldiers under his command. A smaller force, under the command of General Rodolfo Graziani, advanced into Ethiopia from Italian Somaliland. By 6 October, Ottawa was captured by De Bono's forces. By 15 October, De Bono's forces moved on to capture the holy capital of Aksum, the invading Italians looted the obelisk of Oxum after capturing the city. On 7 October, the League of Nations declared Italy the aggressor and started the slow process of imposing sanctions. These did not extend to several vital materials, such as oil. The British and French argued that if they refused to sell oil to the Italians, they would then simply get it from the United States, which was not a member of the League. By mid-December, De Bono was replaced by General Pietro Badoglio because of the slow, cautious nature of his advance. Haile Selassie decided to test this new general with an attack, but his forces were repelled due to the Italian superiority in heavy weapons like 
machine guns and artillery. On 20 January 1936, the Italians resumed the offensive at the First Battle of Tombion between the Warriou Pass and Makala. The fighting proved inconclusive and ended in a draw on 24 January. In addition to conventional weaponry, Badoglio's troops also made substantial use of mustard gas in both artillery and aerial bombardments. In total, the Italians deployed between 300 and 500 tons of mustard gas during the war, despite having signed the 1925 Geneva Protocol. The deployment of gas was not restricted to the battlefield, however, as civilians were also targeted by the Italians as part of their attempt to terrorize the local population. Furthermore, the Italians carried out gas attacks on Red Cross camps and ambulances. Besides bombs laced with mustard gas, the Italians instituted forced labor camps, installed public gallows, killed hostages, and mutilated the corpses of their enemies. Graziani ordered the elimination of captured guerrillas by throwing them out of airplanes in mid-flight. Many Italian troops had themselves photographed next to cadavers hanging from the gallows or hanging around chests full of detached heads. One episode in the Italian occupation of Ethiopia was the slaughter of Addis Ababa in February 1937, which followed an attempt to assassinate Graziani. During an official ceremony, a bomb exploded next to the general. The response was immediate and cruel. He said, avenge me, kill them all. The 30 or so Ethiopians present at the ceremony were impaled, and immediately after, the black shirts of the fascist militias poured out into the streets of Addis Ababa, where they tortured and killed all of the men, women, and children that they encountered in their path. They also set fire to homes in order to prevent the inhabitants from leaving and organized the mass executions of groups of 50 to 100 people. On 29 March, Graziani's forces firebombed the city of Harar. Two days later, the Italians won the last major battle of the war, the Battle of Mechu. Haile Selassie fled into exile on 2 May and Badoglio's forces took the capital, Addis Ababa, on 5 May. Italy annexed the country on 7 May, and the Italian king, Victor Emmanuel III, was proclaimed emperor on 9 May. Italy merged Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Somaliland into a single state known as Italian East Africa. In exile in Britain, Haile Selassie sought to gain the support of the Western democracies for his cause, but had little success until Italy entered World War II on the side of Germany in June 1940. Italian East Africa proved to be a short-lived state as Ethiopia was liberated from Italian control in the subsequent East African campaign in 1941. Not long after, several ethnic rebellions began in the country against continued Amhara domination in Ethiopia under the reign of Haile Selassie. After the rebuff Italy experienced after her invasion of Abyssinia, the only choice of allies left for Mussolini was Germany and Franco's Spain. In July 1936, a civil war broke out in Spain between the Republicans and the Nationalists, led by the Army General Franco. The Republicans got support from various groups throughout Europe. Stalin of Russia sent aid and troops, though they were referred to as volunteers, so as not to offend the League of Nations. This in itself tended to condemn the Republicans in the eyes of many in Europe, as Stalin and the communist regime in Russia still terrified many. Mussolini and Hitler sent support and volunteers to Franco. Mussolini saw Italian involvement in Spain as yet another opportunity to expand his power and influence. 
not all Italians were pro-Franco. Some Italians, who had moved abroad during Mussolini's time in power, formed the Garibaldi Brigade. They fought on the Republican side. At the Battle of Guadalajara, Italians fought Italians. The Spanish Civil War was deeply unpopular in Italy, as many people there could not see what it had to do with them. Adding to this resentment was the fact that the Italian forces fighting there were far from successful. This alienation in Europe and at home drove Mussolini even further toward Hitler. Mussolini referred to Italy and Germany as being the most influential countries in Europe and that all the rest of Europe would revolve around this axis. In September 1937, Mussolini visited Germany. Hitler put on a major display of military power for Mussolini and by the end of the visit, Mussolini became convinced that Germany was the power he should ally with. He was sure that an alliance with Germany would lead to Italy becoming a major power throughout Europe. In 1938, Germany occupied Austria in the Anschluss. Hitler did not forewarn Mussolini about what he was going to do, and this upset Mussolini's belief that he was an equal partner. However, there was nothing Mussolini could do about it. It was now clear from 1938 on that Mussolini was definitely the minor partner in the Axis. However, Mussolini achieved real fame for the part he played in the Munich Agreement of September 1938. War seemed a real possibility in the autumn of 1938. The major powers took the opportunity to meet in Munich, an idea suggested by Mussolini. The outcome was the piece of paper which at the time seemed to everyone to guarantee European peace. Mussolini got the credit for this. After Munich, Mussolini's reputation was at its peak. To many, he seemed to be Europe's savior, a reputation that he assumed made him Europe's premier statesman. Hitler's invasion of Czechoslovakia in March 1939 angered Mussolini because it was clear that Germany was carving out its own empire and Italy was not to share in the spoils. To compensate for this, Mussolini took over Albania on Good Friday, 1939. To him, this was a sign of Italy's expanding power in Europe. King Victor Emmanuel was offered the title of King of Albania. Italian propaganda made a great deal out of this, but in reality, Albania had been under the influence of Italy for years, and this was barely an Italian military success. Mussolini made it clear to Hitler that he expected Italy to have the Adriatic Sea as a sphere of influence. In May 1939, the Germans and Italians cemented their friendship with the Pact of Steel. This pact committed both countries to support the other if one of them became involved in a war. The Italian foreign minister, Galeazzo Ciano, Mussolini's son-in-law, realized that this pact was potentially very damaging for Italy, but Mussolini was more concerned with the prestige of allying with Europe's most potent power rather than politics. Mussolini also considered that Hitler's new non-aggression pact with communist Russia involved Italy, and he saw it as a three-nation treaty, though Italy never signed it. On 1 September 1939, Nazi Germany invaded Poland. Hitler had informed Mussolini what his plans were and fully expected Italian help. Mussolini, for all his boasts, realized that the Italian army was not up to fighting in September 1939. Therefore, the Italians did not join in the German attack, despite the Pact of Steel. Shortly after Bristol received its 11th raid, Mr. Churchill visits the battle-scarred city. Few statesmen have won such universal admiration as Britain's Prime Minister. We recall the words of Mr. Roosevelt. In this historic crisis, Britain is blessed with a brilliant and great leader in Winston Churchill. And it was to the bombed people of Bristol that Mr. Churchill gave his stirring pledge. We'll give it to them back. 
Later, he electrifies Cardiff and Swansea with his cheerful personality. Originally intended to be a secret visit, it becomes a triumphal tour. The people of South Wales swarm round there, Winnie cheering him to the echo. Almost lost in the midst of his admirers, no film star has received such a tumultuous reception. The British government of Neville Chamberlain was in crisis in the spring of 1940. The Norwegian campaign was crumbling. Despite Churchill's acceptance of blame as First Lord of the Admiralty for the Norway debacle, he was summoned to Buckingham Palace and asked to form a government on 10 May 1940. In his first speech to Parliament on May 13, Churchill uttered the famous quote, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears and sweat. That morning, the Germans swept through Holland and Luxembourg and were moving on Belgium. The blitzkrieg that had claimed Poland, Denmark, and Norway was heading for France and the Low Countries. Luxembourg could not resist and surrendered immediately. Holland attempted a conventional defense, flooding large areas and blowing up bridges, but German Luftwaffe aircraft bombed Rotterdam on May 14. 800 were dead and 78,000 were homeless. Most of the Dutch government, the Queen and her King fled to London. She surrendered the next day to spare other cities. Belgium declared its neutrality and refused to allow the British expeditionary force to enter the country. The BEF defied the Belgian order but had no effect. The British quickly organized Plan Dynamo the evacuation of some 330,000 British and French troops to England. Civilian craft were called to take out the British Expeditionary Force. As Dunkirk was evacuated, Churchill flew to Paris again on 31 May. He met the aging Marshal Auguste Pétain, who was a growing force in the French government. Claiming to be willing to fight on from their colonies should England fall, Churchill felt that Pétain intended to end the war unilaterally. On 4 June, Italian Duce Benito Mussolini was directing his forces to plan for the invasion of southern France. The entry of Italy into the war on the side of Germany was a blatant attempt to grab French spoils. Hitler asked Mussolini to postpone until 10 June. At midnight, Italy declared war on England and France, and her armies moved into southern France. When Churchill received word of the Italian entry into the war, he responded by saying, the hand that held the dagger stabbed its neighbor in the back. As the Italian army moved into defenseless France, the British moved against Italian forces in Libya. Both theaters saw the defeat of the Italians. When Italy declared war on 10 June 1940 against Britain and France, the British position in North Africa seemed hopelessly outmatched. UK Army General Percival Wavell commanded 40,000 Dominion soldiers caught between 200,000 Italian troops in Libya and 250,000 to the south in Ethiopia and Somaliland. Wavell made a bold gamble, sending a small force into Libya to show the flag. This was the opening battle in a long campaign that would frustrate both the Allies and the Axis. On 14 June, with Pétain and Wygon formed a new government, seeking to gain an armistice on 16 June. On June 18, Churchill addressed Parliament. What General Wygon called the Battle of France is over. The Battle of Britain is about to begin. Pétain asked for an armistice on June 22, 1940. Humiliating surrender terms were signed in the same railway car that the Germans had signed their armistice in November 1918. Hitler then had it blown up 
so it would never be used again. Mussolini now began to look for more conquests on which to build his new Roman Empire.